evening. We've got an intermittent interactive plan for you like you've never seen before and not only because we have one of the world's, and I wouldn't even say Canadian, one of the world's best singer, songwriters, visual artists, creative artists of all time here with us tonight, but also because it is an intimate and interactive show, which means that you and you and you and you all get to play a part of it. We're going to be taking your phone calls, your faxes, we've got an email system set up that I'm going to give you all those numbers a little bit later on, so get your pencils ready. Some of these people here are going to be asking questions, and um, there's all these people there over by the window. Have you seen them? The window's sort of closed. I don't know, what do you think? Should we open the window and let them partake? You think? Ooh, a little hesitant. What do you think? Should we let them? Okay. The milk of human kindness runs through your bones. Okay, guys. Welcome to the show. Okay, okay, now just a couple, no problem. You excited about being here? Oh my God, yes. <laughs> this, is, this is the moment of my life. I think that she just spoke for pretty well everybody in this room. Um, I don't want to mess around and listen to me palathering on for any longer, so I want you right now, I know it's going to be really tough to do, let's have a warm welcome for Joni Mitchell. to be here and now I have to sing like a sad song. I don't know, I gotta get into the mood here. Psych, psych down, so to speak. Uh, this song came out of the, the last night of the LA riots. I pulled up behind a long white car. In LA they tag their, their cars like uh, in a personal manner and this guy had the license plate, just ice. And I never really thought about that word quite in that manner, justice, just ice. So for the weeks that followed, and especially in the uproar we were in down there, not that I'm not a Canadian, I want you to know I live part of the year in British Columbia, I'm sort of like a bi-national, I guess you'd say at this point. Um, I asked everybody I knew about justice, what is it, everybody wants it, nobody knows what it is. Well, nobody knows, they all know they want it, but nobody knows what it is. I even read Plato's Republic, which was based on the premise that if you built a just society, you could have justice. So Pla Plato describes the Socratic just society, but it would be unjust to the likes of me because it was a society of specialists. For, you had to be either a painter, a poet, or a musician, but you couldn't tackle all three. So, so I would already be pinched in this society. So I don't know to this day what a just society or what justice is, but, but this is kind of what went down. Behind a Cadillac, we were waiting for the light. I took a look at his license plate, it said, Just ice. It's just as just ice, governed by greed and lust. Just the strong doing what they can, and the weak suffering. What they must And the gas leaks And the oil spills And sex sells everything Sex kills Oh, sex kills Give 
Give you brand new wheels And the bills bury you like an avalanche And lawyers haven't been this popular since Robus Pierre slaughtered half of France And Indian chiefs with their old beliefs Know that the, the balance is undone Crazy icons You can feel it out in traffic Everyone hates everyone And the gas leaks And the oil spills And sex sells everything And sex kills Oh, sex kills All these jack-offs at the office The rapist in the pool Oh, and the tragedies in the nurseries Little kids packing guns to school The ulcerated ozone These tumors of the skin This hostile sun beating down On the massive mess we're in and the gas leaks And the oil spills And sex sells everything And sex kills Oh, sex kills She's blue, she says And tell me something good You know I'd help her out if I only could Oh, but sometimes the light Can be so hard to find At least the moon at the window The thieves left that People don't know how to love The taste didn't toss it Turn it off and on like a Bath up faucet Oh, sometimes the light Can be so hard to find At least the moon at the window The thieves left that behind I wish her heart I know these battles Deep in the dark When the spooks of memories rattle Ghosts of the future Phantoms of the past Rattle, rattle, rattle In the spoon and the glass to care and yet not care 
since love has two faces, hope and despair. And pleasure always turns to fear, I find. At least the moon at the window, the thieves left that behind. Moon at the window, they left that behind. I'm sure glad all you people are here to clap because the last thing I want to do is have my voice come out <laughs> over the loudspeaker after that. Thanks, Joni. I wanted to ask you one question because the, the, when we're going to ask, be asking questions from everybody here in the house and phones and faxes and we've got an email set up and they've been, people have been typing for days out there. Um, the first song, Sex Kills, was from the new album, Turbulent Indico. Mm. And until I got here today and actually saw the, uh, the picture of the album cover on the uh, screen, so I knew that how it was connected there, <laughs> but before I was thinking about the words turbulent indigo, and I had this mental picture of like a therapeutic finger paint, you know, that's like <laughs> round and round in circles, yeah. like this vortex. Where does it come from? Turbulent indigo? Um, the swirl of N goes brush strokes, basically. Yeah. Like this? Yeah. yeah. Like that. Yeah. They, they attribute it with madness, but I don't think so. You know, it's just, <laughs> it's just fluidity. <laughs> <laughs> And this uh, came, there's a Canadian connection, I understand, here. The Canadian Council on uh, Making Van Gogh Conference you, you attended? You, you want to open that can of worms? Okay. I don't know. If, was it a <laughs> can of worms? <laughs> well, let's see. Like, how can I say this briefly? Um, well, I got invited on the 23rd of May a few years back to, to speak from my heart, was the way it was put to me, about art and education to address the Canadian Council of the Arts in my hometown of Saskatoon. Now, the 23rd of May is the day before my mother's birthday, she shares that birthday with Bob Dylan and Queen Victoria, extreme moralists, a lot of them, you know. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so I thought, well, this would be good. I'll book myself home, you know, so I can spend my, my mom's birthday with her. So I got up there, and they told me, speak from, you know, from the heart. And we went over it. I said, well, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell about an excellent teacher, a killer great teacher that I had in the seventh grade, Kratzman. And then I'm going to be critical of the Alberta Institute of the Arts, the, the, would not make available the knowledge that I needed when I got there. Um, fine, fine, they said. So at the time I had attempted to quit smoking, which I've done many times in my life. <laughs> and because I wasn't smoking, I couldn't write anything. So I said, I'm just going to go off the cuff on this. So you know, I'll, I'll give these two examples, good education and bad education, in my opinion, and then we'll throw it open to questioning. Mm. Fine, they said, you know. So when we threw it open to questioning, I got some questions like, you know, what other famous people do you know? You know, and, and uh, I, I was kind of, I thought, who are these people? You know, I'm sure that there are bright people out in this room, but they seem not to be speaking up. Um, the, the, the pamphlets, there were eight topics of discussion for, for the week, and I was like the dessert speaker. Two of those topics were offensive to me. One of them said, now that the arts are being taught in the high school level in Saskatchewan and I believe BC, does that mean that we have to become artists in order to teach arts? I thought, well, yeah, you know, you should know something about it, you know, like. <laughs> and the second one showed me, like, where government funding comes from, you know, like the, the, the government, you know, I know from myself that the arts, art school in Alberta was shoved in with, with uh, auto mechanics and cafeteria cooking. It was like, well, if they can't do anything else, surely they can do something decorative, you know? <laughs> so the topic of discussion was, we're going to make Van Goghs out of women, you know, women, uh, immigrants, and uh, the Canadian native, you know, Canada's useless. Well, what do we do with them? You know, like uh, the women, they won't, gee, they won't stay home and cook and clean anymore. You know, well, maybe we can get them to bind wheat into Christmas ornaments. Okay, we'll give some money to that, you know. 
But it was all under the banner of we're going to make Van Gogh. So I found myself, the painters were the first to walk on me. And basically what they said, it was in the news the next day, we don't need some pop singer, some rich pop singer who left the country years ago, which is not true, <laughs> um, standing up there and telling us that she's a serious artist, you know. So they, they walk. They all look like the Smith brothers. You can always like... You can always spot them, you know, they get all this facial fur, you know? So, I, I found the whole thing upsetting, and basically what I said to them was like, you know, and I think this is true, you cannot make an artist, you can make a person who can tie wheat into little neat Christmas ornaments, but um, an artist is born, you know, they're born, they're born with an artistic attitude, and, and they're, they're born, they're, they're born, to be the axe for the frozen sea within us, you know, they're born to be in conflict, they're born to be an alien, they're born to be an outsider, you know, and um, so the song, Turbulent Indigo, and the album cover, you know, which is, looks kind of like Catherine Hepburn, but it's actually, <laughs> it's not a fashion item, that band-aid, so it's going to be a little mini <laughs> ear, like a Cracker Jack prize fall out of the first 10,000 copies. <laughs> I'm so thrilled you're here. You know, people don't know you're this funny. <laughs> they have no idea. <laughs> I know, it's like drama is what I'm known for. You know, but... <laughs> Joni, the thespian, great. Now, okay, well, it's been great talking for me from just one question here, but we're going to let the rest of the country talk, and I'm just going to nip over here, because we have an email system come up, and I'm going to grab your question from the email. Cool? So, and here's Sean over here. Sean's been collecting... Um, questions. Have you got something? We sure do. We've got a question from Eric J. Eric is emailing us from San Francisco via the well. His first question <laughs> to Joni is, a friend told me recently that you often take an extremely long time to write down phrases or words while you are writing a song, that you often sit smoking with your pen poised to write, <laughs> and an intense concentration. What carries you off to that level of concentration, and to what do you owe your ability to create the high poetry of your songs? Well, I think I'm autistic, you know. <laughs> uh, things stick in my craw, and they rotate endlessly, and if I don't clear them, you know, like I could go mad. So, and I want to clear them in an interesting manner, and, and the arts um, seem to be the answer to that. Uh, yes, I do smoke endlessly. Um, I, yes, I do not so much rewrite as write copiously and then condense. Uh, you know, a lot of these themes are very, very large and people don't like long, 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 long songs. So they have to be condensed down to three verses. Uh, does that answer it? That's very good, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we're, uh, well, people at home want to participate too, so we're just going to roll a tape here. This is how you call us. Here are the phone numbers and the fax numbers to get a hold of us tonight. If you would like to get intimate and interactive with Joni Mitchell for questions and comments, the toll-free number to call is 1-800-265-MUCH. That's 1-800-265-6824. By fax, the number to call is area code 416-591-MUCH. That's area code 416-591-6824. Okay, that's how you do it. We've got a question from the audience here. Anybody? Yes, I want to know what inspired Magdalene Laundries. Oh, ah. well... I live in British Columbia as much as I possibly can. Um, because I'm absent sometimes, I have a, a man named Hans who he and his family caretake my place. And Hans, sucking on his pipe, said to me one day, you know, Joni, you're basically a cheerful person, but you write these melancholy songs. He said, seems to me that you should write more in the daylight. You're always writing at night. So I sat out in the sun on a rock, and I tuned my guitar to the sound of that day, because I play in open tunings like ragas. So I tuned to the to the crows and the seagulls and, and the, the, the sonic references available. And it was a fairly cheerful chord progression. Mm, you know, well, a little melancholy in it because beauty has little. But um, anyway, I intended to write quite a cheery lyric to it. Well, I went to the supermarket to get my groceries and standing in the line between the Inquirer and the Star was the Vancouver Sun. and. I never bought a paper in my life. What possessed me, I don't know. But I picked this paper up, and I never got past the first page. To the left hand of the page was a story that, out of Ireland that the sisters of Our Lady of Charity outside of Dublin, which was a nunnery, had sold 11 and a half acres to realtors. The realtors, in plowing this land for development, unearthed over 100 bodies in unmarked graves. 
thus opening up a scandal that had rocked Dublin from, they said, 1800 to 1970, these laundries were closed. Basically, the Magdalene laundries, which stood outside of, there was an, uh, every major Irish town and maybe some minor ones, um, employed, well, employed, uh, took as slave labor fallen women. Fallen women were classified as the obvious, I guess, prostitutes, um, uh, unmarried mothers, frequently impregnated by their parish priest, their father, their brother. But the worst of all was that an unmarried woman in her late 20s, if the men of the village were looking at her, she could be deemed a Jezebel by the parishioners and even her own family for her indecisiveness in choosing a mate and incarcerated for life, or at least until somebody managed to, to, to get her out of there. This was cheap labor. Dickensian conditions was the way it was described. Well, you know, I, there went my cheerful song. So, I mean, <laughs> this is the story of the Magdalene Laundries. I was an unmarried girl I just turned 27 When they sent me to the sisters For the way men looked at me Branded as a Jezebel I knew I was not bound for heaven I'd be cast in shame into the Magdalene Laundries. Most girls come here pregnant, some by their own fathers. Bridget got that belly by her parish priest. We're trying to get things white as snow. All of us woe-begotten daughters In the steaming stains of the Magdalene laundries Prostitutes and destitutes and temptresses like me Sentenced into dreamless drudgery Why do they call this heartless place Our Lady of Charity? Oh, Charity These bloodless brides of Jesus If they had just once glimpsed their room and they'd know And they'd drop those stones Concealed behind their rosaries They wilt the grass they walk upon They leech the light out of a room They'd like to drive us down the drain At the Magdalene Laundry O'Connell died today She was a cheeky girl A flirt They just stuffed her in a hole Surely to God You'd think at least Some bells should ring One day I'm gonna die here too And they'll Plant me in the dirt Like some lame bulb That never bloomed any spring, no, oh, not any spring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. 
that question over there. What's that? It's almost like we planted that question over there. We did an honest question song. Let's see if it works as well over here. Question here. Hi. How are you? Fine, thanks. What's your name? My name's Patsy. Hi, Patsy. Hi. I have a question that has, again, to do with the process of songwriting. Um, it's kind of two parts. First of all, it, do you approach the music and the words simultaneously? And is that a process that takes over um, Hours, days, months, how does that writing work? Well, everything's different. Um, at the extreme end of the, the, the long time to make a song happen, um, I, uh, I had a song on the last album called Two Grey Rooms, which took seven years to get, to get the libretto to. It wanted to be written in French. It wanted French diphthongs. The music came first, and, and ideally, Long, long, long. Those vowels would have been best with that melody. I have another one that wants to be written in, in Spanish or Italian. It wants O's at the end of sentences sonically. So once, once I get that B in my bonnet, it makes it more difficult to parquet. Sometimes they come together. Usually the music comes first because it offers up a more challenging rhyme scheme. It also shows me where I can put my descriptive passage, where I have to be direct, where my pockets of irony lie. You know, it lays down restrictions. It makes it a harder puzzle, which I enjoy. <laughs> a French diphthong. I've always wanted one of those myself, actually. <laughs> <laughs> For your very own. <laughs> uh, Joni, we have what we call speakers' corners here in Canada. There's one out in the corner, and there's a couple going across the country. And we alerted the people who work the speakers' corners that you were coming in. And so we've got some questions for you. Here's one from a speakers' corner, and uh, I don't know where it's from, actually. It might be from Toronto. Proud to be a Canadian. I'm proud that you are a Canadian. Um, and have your feelings towards Canada changed over the years at all? Um, I I travel so much and I have friends so in so many countries that that borderlines uh, feel strange to me in a certain way, and I think that they cause a, a natural. Um, separation in a certain way. Uh, I'm annoyed with borderlines, I think, more than, than I um, I was born in Saskatchewan. When I go back there, I, uh, there's no place that is going to stimulate me and excite me like the, where I came from. Um, uh, I, I feel that Canada is harsh on its young artists, or it was in the beginning, that, that because of the chip that in the beginning they, that, that people didn't recognize that I was good, as soon as I crossed the border, they thought I was great. Then, then I got too big to my, for my britches, and everybody like kind of wanted to put a lid on me. I think that the, the, the Canadian chip, you know, that we are, I think we are such a great country. I, I live in British Columbia, in, a, in answer to your question. I'm not an expatriate. I spend as much time as I possibly can there. I can't really go home because people are, are funny about success. And although I have some lifelong friends from there, two or three fellas, you know, who've come and camped in my house when I had lunatics coming over my wall, like brothers, you know. Like, some people have been able to, to know that, that, that Joan Anderson still exists within Joni Mitchell, but very few people know that. They measure their own ac personal acquisitions and attainments against mine. We have a cottage at the lake, they'll say, all lit up. Of course, it's nothing like Malibu, they'll say. You know, like, I can't do anything about them, you know. I say, but I know what a cottage at the lake is. I, I know it has kerosene, that's wonderful, you know, like you can try and equalize yourself but they won't let you. Also, I'm culturally different, I've lived in a warm climate where freedom of, of a much more affectionate climate than I grew up in. The long cold winters and the Scottish and the Irish blood are creative and emotionally withholding people. Uh, I found it restrictive there as a child for that reason. Uh, I'm more, you know, like open-hearted by nature. 
Uh, I like the affection of warmer climates. The, you know, I like climates where people say I love you to each other, and it's not jive. It's not the Hollywood kissy poo. You can tell, you know, it, it isn't, you know. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, the Hollywood kissy poo litmus test. I think we should all have one of those when we walk around. <laughs> We're going to take a commercial right now, and when we come back, you'll have a lot more Joni Mitchell, a lot more intimate and interactive questions, and a lot more music. Stay tuned. Uh, we've had some great conversation and great music already tonight, and I know there's lots more to come. Uh, we've got a phone call, actually. Who's on the line? Hello? Hello, hi. Hi, David, how are you? Fine. Good, have you got a question? Yes, I do. Okay, what's your question, David? Joni? Yeah. I saw you at the Edmonton Folk Festival this year. I just want to say this, and I really liked your performance. Thank you very much. It was really good. Thank you. <laughs> do you have a question? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, I'm 16 years old and I'm a guitar player. Okay. And I want to make it in, I want to, you know, take a career as a musician. Okay. I was wondering what advice you'd have oh. in that area. Practice, practice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, open tunings, would that be good advice? <laughs> I, I wouldn't know, that would be bad advice. Open tunings are a pain in the butt. It's like a typewriter that, that, that the letters move around on you every time that you sit down to it. But it does cough up um, original harmonic movement. If you, want, if you want original harmonic movement and you're willing to like, confuse your left hand completely, then go for it. Hmm. Just you go, twiddle David. the pegs until you like the chord and then search for the shapes within it. <laughs> yeah. Got that, David? Were you writing that down? Yeah. Okay, now go practice. Johnny? Yeah. Thank you for your music, okay? Eh? Oh, you're very welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Now, guitar wasn't actually your first instrument, was it? I, I read that you started on the piano and yeah. then picked up a baritone ukulele. Baritone ukulele. By choice, you picked up a baritone ukulele. Well, well no, by finance, I picked oh. up a baritone. <laughs> I couldn't afford a guitar, you know, so I had to sacrifice two strings. $36 for a baritone ukulele it was, and it was considerably more for a guitar. Yeah, I started, I took a year of piano lessons, I think a year and a half, grade two piano, I think I got that far. But they, they wrapped my knuckles, which was not just singling me out, it was the style of teaching at the time. It, it was quicker for me to play, I could grasp it quicker, learn it quicker by ear, so that I wasn't reading properly. And what they did to all piano players that I have talked to at that time was to slam them with the ruler. And I thought, oh, gee, this, this lesson conflicts with Wild Bill Hickok. And given my druthers, I'd rather listen to Wild Bill Hickok on the radio than, than have my knuckles wrapped. So that was the end of my piano playing for, m for many years until I made my first record. And I attempted an overdub on that. But the piano came back. As a child, I wanted to, to compose. I heard melodies in my head, but that was considered. I mean, my teacher said to me, well, why would you want to play? by ear when you can have the masters under your fingers. Well, I said, I get these melodies in my head that, that I would like to get out. I just want enough chops so that I can get them out. But th that was misunderstood in a small community. Mm. Yeah, it's often g restrictive rather than uh, evolving, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Creativity, I think, generally, in terms of lessons, gets overlooked for tradition. So anything original is kind of repressed and mm. mistaken for something else. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's change all that. We have a fax here. Uh, Dear Joni, your beautiful words of music have inspired and touched me in too many ways to mention. Your musical poetry has been the background to all of the important, all of the important events of my life. That happens a lot, eh, people? Uh, yeah. Music has a power, you know, like yeah. if it's not me, it's someone else, but, but we all have a backdrop for a score to our lives, yeah. that's for sure. Uh, Bonnie Gladstone would like to know if you have any plans to tour or do live concerts in the future. Well, I'm sticking my toe in the water, aren't I? <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm feeling it out, perhaps, maybe. <laughs> uh, not giving anything away right yet. We're going to walk over to the email and uh, see what we've got over there. 
And then, as soon as we do this email question, Johnny, we're going to have another couple songs, I hope. Yes. Okay. I Who hope we so got too. here, Sean? Uh, this time we've got Leia Weston from New York City. Just for your information, we've got over 20 emails so far, so we're getting quite a bit of response. Uh, Leia's question is Dear Joni, you've had a number of famous collaborations in the past. And my favorite was what with other Tom Scott. People, you know? <laughs> 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 Have they had a lasting impact on your music, and are you planning any in the future? Ah, uh, a lasting impact. No, the only thing that lasting uh, and impacting, I guess, is, is uh, ch chasing something fresh. I don't know. Influent, lasting and impacting. That's so static. Um, The, let me just explain, like, w when I used to record at A&M, there were, like, several studios there, and if someone was playing across the hall, and, and I stuck my head in and it sounded good to me, I'd drag him in and make him sing on my record or play on my record, you know. Since I record in my house now, and there's no one across the hall, really, like, to drag across. So I've gotten into kind of casting, you know, I cast Billy Idol as a bully on one song because I thought he had, he had the appropriate voice for that particular scenario. Um, they're not just chosen arbitrarily, they're chosen because they're the right color. Um, and fame doesn't mean that much to me. The actual vocal quality or what they bring. You're going to do a song now that comes from a famous collaboration. I am? Hegira, yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. that's uh, Jocko. Jocko, my... There we go. Hegira, Tony Mitchell. He 
reach so deep and so superficial between the forceps and the stone I looked at the granite markers those tributes to finality to eternity then I looked at myself here Chicken scratching for a piece of immortality In the church they light the candles And the wax rolls down like tears There is the hope and the hopelessness I've witnessed all my very many years We're just particles of change, I know, I know We're just orbiting around the sun But it's hard to keep that lofty point of view When you're bound and tied to someone White flags of winter chimneys Wave and cruise against the moon the mirrors of a modern bank from the window of my hotel room right. traveling in some vehicle not that one Sitting in some cafe I defect her from the petty wars Until love sucks me back that way in Saskatoon I had two best girlfriends one was Jewish and one was Indian and uh, my my Indian girlfriend her name was Mary Waddington um, her parents had died I think in a reservation fire and she had been adopted into a foster family when I first moved to Saskatoon from North Battleford I thought she was rich because she had a TV set everybody I knew in North Battleford that, that had a TV set owned their own business and that was rich so uh, when I got there, I realized, gee, they were, they were just, they were living in a wartime house just like us. Anyway, Mary and I became best. The, our play involved, we were in the swimming club together, we painted together, and we also, like, went to the Grand Trunk Bridge together. That's a, Saskatoon, my hometown, is like, it's called the City of Bridges. And um, the Grand Trunk Bridge had a lot of youth bravado rights to it, as did the Broadway Bridge. And, um, this song is set in the Broadway Bridge. At the age of 13, I discovered bigotry. They don't teach you that till you get to be 13. My Jewish girlfriend's parents sent her off to summer camp because I was introducing her to goy boys. And, and Mary's foster father molested her, and she took refuge in the Broadway Bridge when no one would take her into their home because basically we learned at that point that she was a dirty Indian. Mary, victim, innocent victim of a crime, ended up in in a reform school, basically through no fault of her own, and when she came out, the only place for her were the crime families of our town, the Ouellettes and the Trotskys, who were Métis Indians. 
Um, what happened to her, I don't know. The name Cherokee Louise is, is poetic license, but Mary, wherever you are, this song is for you. Cherokee Louise is hiding in this tunnel in the Broadway Bridge. We are crawling on our knees. We've got chocolates and cheese. We've got cold cats from the fridge. Last year, about this time, we used to climb up in the branches just to sway there in some breeze. Now the cops on the street, they want the Cherokee Louise. People like to talk, thumbs up, wagging over fences. They're wagging over phones. All their doors are locked. She can't come to our house, but I know where she'll go. The place where you can stand and press your hands like it was bubble bath in dust piled high as me down under the street. My friend, poor Cherokee Louise. Ever since we turned 13, it's like a minefield walking to the door. Oh, when don't you get the third degree? I'm coming in, you get the third world war. Tuesday after school, we put our pennies on the rails as the train rolled by. We were jumping round like fools, going, look, no heads, no tails. Go and look, my lucky prize. Runs home to her foster daddy, opens up his zipper and he yanks her to her knees. Oh, please be here, please, my friend, Cherokee Louise. and silver screen we got cold cuts from the fridge she's in a place where you can stand and press your hands like it was bubble bath and dust piled high as me down under the street my friend oh, Cherokee Louise Cherokee Louise Cherokee Louise Cherokee Louise Cherokee Louise There you go, Cherokee Louise we're going to be coming back with a lot more music, a lot more talk, and uh, we haven't given you the email address yet, so here it is. Here's the email address, and we'll be talking to you on the email as well. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Back into 
Schmidt and Interactive with Joni Mitchell. We are having an unbelievable, wonderful night here tonight. And it's partly because of all the people who are gathered here to get today, tonight. And we've got an audience question here from... Hi. Hi, Joni. I'm Brad. I'm from your hometown, Is that Saskatoon. Right? You're Saskatoonian? I oh. see your father at the golf course every day. Is that right? Yeah. Bill? Yeah, he's trying to beat his age, you know. <laughs> I think he does that. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, how... And where did you start playing in Saskatoon? What type of venues? And how do you go from there to playing Carnegie Hall? Oh, gee, well, I started as a waitress in the Louis Riel, which is down on Broadway there. Do you know where that used to be? And, um, and one night, I, I, was I had a baritone ukulele. Basically, I had no ambition to be a performer because that was kind of unheard of coming from there and at that time to be a woman. It was kind of, no, it wasn't in my mind. You know, basically, I learned to play ukulele to accompany body drinking songs at Waska Sioux, you know. So, uh, anyway, one night the act didn't show up and they said, you know, you're the only one here who can play, you got to go on. So I trembled through this, this little set, you know. Um, it was a reluctant beginning, it was not what I had in mind, you know. Then, then in PA, they took a moose hunting show off the air at 11 o'clock one night and stuck me on for an hour. So, those were my beginnings. How you get there from Carnegie Hall, I guess, is just tenacity. <laughs> great, thanks, Brad. Great, great question. Great question. Hi, everybody. Um, we're going to have a take a speaker's corner question now. This is uh, from Montreal, I believe. Hi, I'm Claire in Montreal, and I'd like to ask Joni Mitchell do your personal relationships have an influence on your music? Uh, Joni? <laughs> How's that for brevity? No, we have to be brief now. <laughs> she said, are you kidding? For the, for the break. <laughs> Actually, maybe I could turn that question around a little bit. The, the, uh, the thing that, that's interesting in it, and it was great the way you introduced uh, Cherokee Louise like that, is because obviously personal relationships and life in general and everything we experience has an effect on sure. you, your painting, your music, all of that. Mm -hmm. But I still, I think that, that maybe one of the things that's been, been odd for you is that a lot of your audience still has trouble distinguishing fiction from reality and well, you none. and made up characters. Yeah. Well, none of it is fiction, but not all of it is autobiographical. Yeah. So, you know, like I sing in first person many different characters. So you have to think of me more as a playwright and an actress. You know, so the playwright, yes, does draw off personal experience, but also, like in, in the case of the Magdalene Laundries, draws off things that, that I have empathy for. I am, I am Lakota, for instance. You know, I, I'm not a Lakota Sioux. I have Indian blood, although my parents deny it. Sammy, European Indian, not quite the same thing. Some of them are blonde, you know, but whatever it is, like, you, you know, you deny your Indian blood on the prairie. It's like low caste. There's, a, there's an elaborate caste system out there. Um, so that they, would, mom, dad, you know, yes, I'm a liar. We don't have it. <laughs> Good. Yeah, that wouldn't happen if you were writing a short story. I guess people would make that dis that uh, distinction. No, they're, they're, the voices in my ear, Joni, are talking to me, and they're saying, "Would you please play a song and quit talking, hmm. Denise? Get off the camera." Okay, thanks. Bye. Here, well, okay. Let's see, what shall I play here? <laughs> Once in a while in a big blue moon There comes a night like this Like some surrealist invented this Fourth of July night ride home Cooler girls and caterpillar trappers in the sand Fourth of July Night ride home I love the men beside me We love the open road No phones till Friday Far from the overkill Far from the overload Back at the bar The band tears down But out here in the headlight beams 
The silver power lines They gleam on this 4th of July Night ride home Sorry about that chord <laughs> We come around the curve In a big dark horse Red tail lights on hills high Is keeping right alongside Rev for stride 4th of July Night ride home I love the men beside me We love the open road No phones till Friday Halloween Far from the overkill Far from the overload Once in a while In a big blue like this Like some surrealist Invented this Fourth of July Night ride home On the night ride home song for all lovers in apartments or with their families, God forbid. It was co-written by my fellow Saskatoonian, Donald Freed. It was a dark and a stormy night. Everyone was at the wingding. the wingding type So they went up on the train bridge where the weather was howling and oh my mind When that train comes rolling by No paper thin walls No folks above No one else can hear love's cry in the rain They knew their love was a strong one When they heard the far off whistle of a train They were hoping it was gonna be a long one Cause oh, oh, oh my, my Then was no folks above No one else can hear love's cries In the back booth of an all-night cafe Two dripping raincoats are hanging Outside in the weather the shade on the street light is clanging And they smile ear to ear, eye to eye Ice cream is melting on a piece of pie And oh, my, my No one else can hear love's cry Strong. Every touch was totally tender when that dream come uh, rumbling along. They sang a lover's song 
wild abandon Oh, oh, my, my When that train comes rolling by No paper thin walls, no folks above No one else can hear love's cry Then walls, no folks above, no one else can hear love's cry. Joni Mitchell right after this. We're back and it's been an interactive with Joni Mitchell. A fabulous evening we're having. Hope and uh, everybody's enjoying it here. I know they are, so hope you're enjoying it at home, too. Who was that guy that was just over here That's hanging around? That's my friend Ed Begley, who's in town doing a movie here. Oh, excellent. Well, yeah. welcome. Yeah. Welcome I'm to so Much Music. To see here. And Jane Sibri. And Jane Sibri's here, yeah. yeah. I'm glad to see you. There's people I know and here. And Berg and Lorraine. It's just full of friends all over the place. <laughs> the whole country is full of friends, Joni. It's just it's wonderful that you're here. <laughs> And I think we have a friend calling in right now. We've got somebody on the phone. Hi, what's your name? Hello on uh, the phone. Hello, yes, this is me. Uh, my name is Shauna, and my question is for Joni. Uh, Hi, Joni. Uh, I'd like Hi. to know if when you were younger and uh, daydreaming well, let's about, not talk about that. where you would be, <laughs> <laughs> uh, when you were daydreaming about where you would be, the level that you are today. Oh, I didn't daydream about that. Oh, not at all? No, no. You, uh, you had melodies in your... I had melodies in my head, but I didn't think... I just wanted to get them out. I didn't have career attached to it, you know? As a matter oh. of fact, I, I had an interesting insight considering the position I'm in now at the age of 16. <laughs> I, I was sitting under a dryer getting ready for a prom and they were doing a beehive on me, you know? <laughs> with sparkle dust in the center of it that would like itch later and you'd have to go at it with a rat tail comb. It was like way down under the hairline, you know? Like, and and Sandra Dee and Bobby Darren were kind of like the king and queen like of, of the magazines. They were the cover girl and boy at the time. And they were really like raking them over the coals with about some kind of marital thing, you know, like scene fighting in public. And I had an assignment. I had to write a poem. Um, I did write some poetry voluntarily, but mostly it was under duress. And uh, I had this poem I had to write. So I wrote a poem about Hollywood <clears throat> sitting in Saskatoon under a hairdryer. It was called the fishbowl. It's, it went like this. It was, it was blank verse, you know. It was very modern. It went, uh, the fishbowl is a world reversed where fishermen with hooks that dangle from the bottom up reel down their catch without a fight on gilded bait. Pike, pickerel, bass, the common fish ogle through distorting glass. See only glitter, glamour, gaiety. Fog up the bowl with lusty breath. Lunge towards the bait and miss and weep for fortune lost. Envy the goldfish? Why? His bubbles breaking round the rim while silly fishes faint for him. <laughs> My God. Fascinating. Fascinating. I think I was smarter when I was 16. <laughs> Great. Great. Thanks for calling. Thank you. Okay. We've got a question. Who's got a question here in the audience? We'll just dive right in. Hi. You're right. I don't even have to walk. What's your name? I'm Mary. Hi, Joni. Uh, Hi, Mary. I wanted to ask you about your collaboration with Seal. I recently uh, heard mm. a second LP, and I was thrilled to hear your uh, harmonies in the background. How did that come about? Um, he, Seal and I met a while back. Um, he found himself in the pop arena almost by accident, and he... he he felt he was doing his growing pains in, in public, and he had chosen me as a standard, and, and uh, he was saying so in the press, and there came a party for him in Los Angeles, and I was invited, and, and, and when we met, we went into a, a very fluid dialogue immediately. We met in a preteen kind of way. Our children liked each other, and, and this friendship developed. And um, 
you know, the child with, within us. We, we got the man, the man woman thing didn't enter into it, and we just started talking. So when it first he sang on my album, and, and then he had this one song that he heard me on. Um, at that point, he, his, his health was poor, and he was in Switzerland kind of recuperating. So he sent it to me. He was actually at my house to record on my album, but, but we did my part as a mailer. And ironically, at that time, I was under doctor's orders not to sing. I had some throat trouble. So I couldn't do very many takes. I, you know, you know, and I, I did the best I could under the circumstances, but it, it came out kind of nice. It's a different kind of singing for me. I never start uh, with the first word holding it out. You know, my, my music is very conversational, very short, you know, so it, it was a treat to sing a different kind of music like that. Mm. Mm. Thank You'll you. be hearing that uh, on the new record when it comes out, Turbulent Indigo. Just thought I'd plug it there for a minute, mm -hmm. if you don't mind. <laughs> We're here we, uh, on the campaign trail. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <laughs> We're getting close to the end of the show, and I wanted to make sure that um, there was an opportunity for you to play a couple more songs and maybe come back and take maybe a couple more questions, depending on how we go. So, Jody, you ready? What do you yeah. think? Just like this train? without claws or any reason to resume and I found this empty seat in this crowded waiting room I found everybody waiting there's an old man sleeping on his banks women with that teased up kind of hair kids with the jitters in their legs and those wide And the kids got cokes and chocolate bars. There's a thin man smoking a fat cigar. Jealous loving will make you crazy if you can't find your goodness, cause you lost your heart. Cause you lost your heart. Jealous. Love. 
loving's gonna make me crazy I can't find my goodness Cause I lost my heart Oh, sour grapes Cause I lost my heart It's about the generation gap, which you'd think at a certain point would end, but mothers being mothers, they, will all, they are always mothers. Um, Mama, if you're listening tonight, I love you so much. This, unfortunately, is, is, is an honest tale of a conflict <laughs> between a middle-aged woman, myself, and, uh, and, and my, my mother uh, on a moral issue. I went so numb on Christmas Day I couldn't feel my hands or feet I shouldn't have come, she made me pay For gleaming with Donald down her street She put blame on him and shame on me She made it all seem so tawdry and cheap Oh, let's be nice, Mama. Open up your gifts, you know. Happiness is the best. Facelift. I mean, after all, she introduced us. Oh, but she regrets that now Shacked up downtown Making love without a license Same old sacred cow She said, did you come home To disgrace us? I said, why is this joy not allowed? For God's sake, son Middle-aged mama, and time moves swift, and you know happiness is the best. Facelift. Love takes so much courage, love takes so much shit He said, you've seen too many movies, Johnny She said, snap out of it Oh, the cold winds blew at our room with you So helpful and hopeful and candlelit We kissed the angel and the moon eclipsed and you know happiness is the best face
push the bed up to the window to see the Christmas lights on the east bank across the steaming river between the bridges lit up Paris like this river has run through both our lives between these banks of our continuing Bless us, don't let us lose the drift, you know, happiness is the best, I can hear a protest from the Society for Cosmetic Surgeons coming yeah. in, actually, right now. <laughs> We're just going to talk to time at this bit. We've got a couple more moments left to go. So here's a couple of faxes um, from Tracy Jones and Shauna Gray in Toronto. We've always liked your version of Woodstock better, so there. <laughs> and, uh, <yeah. laughs> what are one or two of your favorite books and authors, and why? Ah, OK. Um, First piece of literature I was introduced to by a teacher named Craftsman was Rudyard Kipling's Kim. Um, I think it set my predilection. Uh, I, I think it broke a lot of barriers down. Here was an orphan kid with no guidance all by his own, with no one to tell him that there were lines. He was able to move authentically through many communities. You know, uh, that was a very inspiring book. And the Castaneda books also, all of them. Mm. There was a, a um, we talked a little bit earlier when I, I was asked to listen to the voices in my head and pay attention and get off the air, but is there a book for you? Because you, you write in such a narrative, descriptive style, and uh, you know, songs obviously work so well because the music is, is there as well to help impart the emotionality you want, but is there a long form in the offing? Do you think you'd want to attempt that? I tried. I tried writing short stories. I used to meet with a friend of mine, Peter Elbling. We, we had our first professional gig in Calgary together when we were 18, and he, he writes comedy in Los Angeles. We write short stories and from time to time get together and, and present them. I felt that I wrote in an adolescent voice. In the meantime, I wrote uh, uh, Catcher in the Rye, which is written in an adolescent voice and very well. For a while, I was prejudiced against my voice in that particular form. Um, I've attempted it. I'll attempt it again. Mm, I will look forward to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to have to close up the show right now, otherwise, because Electric Circus is just about to be on. And if we don't, you and I are going to have to uh, bear our midriffs and jump on those risers. Oh, and, no. Uh, <laughs> I don't know about you, but I don't want to flick mine on the planet. Oh, no, so. no, no, no. I'm I 50, <laughs> God forbid. It's like Duke Boris. Put it on. Put it on. <laughs> So I just uh, want to say from the bottom of my heart, and I know from the heart of everybody who's in this room and everybody who's out there across the country, thank you so much for sharing this evening with thank us. Thank you, Denise. <laughs> my pleasure. Yeah. Any last questions? Oh, they're just going to clap forever. That's all they're going to do. <laughs> We'll have a camera. We'll say goodnight. Okay. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Oh, 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 oh. No, it's your present. No, no, I'll it for you. Another special moment. Ten years of special moments for Warner Music. Thank you to the Much Music Act. Nice to have Joni here again. Thank you very much. Oh, this is to us. Oh, yes. This is supposed this to be to Joni. No, no, no. This is your award moment, you Denise. They called me at the office. I just want to give you a piece of advice. <laughs> they said I had to bring Joni. Thank you. <laughs> I think you, you, this Thanks is very, very opportunistic much. of you Warner guys. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, thank you. <laughs> Stan just said, welcome back to the family, to Joni. Okay, I'll take it off your hands. Great, thank you, thank you. We're 10 years old, for anybody who hasn't noticed already. <laughs> All right. You can step on your show like that. I'll tell you. I gave him permission, but I didn't think it was opportunistic, but I gave him permission anyway. That's how real hearted I am. Sitting on the <laughs> Now do we have to say hello to Electric Circus? Should I go do that? I defect her from okay. the petty You guys enjoy. Talk amongst yourselves. I'll be sure, back in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> production that's the end of this show and we're gonna go on to that bouncy fabulous show over there on the rise is Monica have a great show in AC. Denise thank you that was an amazing show hard act to follow but we're gonna try stay tuned to much music electric circus is live right after this <laughs> 